earlier, Nick gave you a broader definition of entrepreneurship. I'd like to broaden that a little more. So think of a serial entrepreneur. Who comes to mind? It's probably not somebody at a large company, the government, or even at a national lab. It's probably somebody like Richard Branson, who at age 34 started Virgin Airways, has over 400 companies under his Virgin brand now. Forbes defines a serial entrepreneur simply as somebody who finds a need and fills it. I would add to that somebody with the passion to build and create and to risk the status quo in order to make something better. And by risk the status quo, I mean think of something that you're passionate about, that you're very close to, you're comfortable with, and change it to make it better. That's what an entrepreneur does. So I'd like to take a step back a little bit and think about what if we had serial entrepreneurs in large companies? We need serial entrepreneurs in our large companies because they're the ones that create new opportunity. I'd like to tell you a story that I think, and I hope, illustrates this for you. Uh, as a young child, it was clear I liked to create and build and repair things, maybe even if they weren't broken. <laughs> Recently, it was suggested that I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I thought, how could that be? I work at a large company a government-funded company. And I thought about it. I thought, well, I do like to build and create. And I really do risk the status quo in order to make things better, even my own job at times. But I work at a large company, as I said, uh, a national laboratory, and I've been there for 29 years. And I started as a mechanical engineer uh, just out of college. I've had 17 distinct jobs at this same company. Started four offices, five companies, run orga organizations of over 500 people. The first entrepreneurship opportunity came three years out of college. The senior operational managers knew it was time to modernize our, our utility systems. <clears throat> so they asked me to get involved and help lead a $100 million retrofit program to transform our utility systems from what some call Baghdad Power and Light, <laughs> into what became one of the most reliable in the nation. We invested in people, in equipment. We really changed the way we had been doing operations for the past 40 years. So then I moved on to another opportunity. And this one was closer to some of the things I've learned in school, uh, engineering and construction. And in this case, we really took an organization and made an internal construction company. And we gave people broader responsibilities, reduced the handoffs from person to person within the organization. And as a result, people reported that they enjoyed their jobs more. And at the same time, we, we cut costs by over $20 million a year. So I was beginning to enjoy this, this change in, in entrepreneurship. And I moved on to another operational opportunity, which is a maintenance organization. It had different kinds of challenges. Costs were going through the roof, and we were doing thousands of jobs a year, so it, was, it wasn't really clear how you could control that. And so this time, I really needed to use my engineering background and dig into the data, and I did, and what I learned was that about 80% of the cost resulted in less than 10% of the work. When we focused people on that 10%, costs went down by almost a third overnight. So this was really starting to roll, and I was really enjoying myself, and then came along a different opportunity. It was different because my boss said, okay, here's a job. This organization's running really well. So you don't need to change anything. Just keep it running smoothly. That's not what I do. <laughs> so I went ahead and started changing things. And it didn't go so well. Uh, the organization wasn't ready for it. Definitely my boss wasn't ready for it. <clears throat> things went downhill quick. And uh, it was the first time I left the job not knowing where I was going to go. It was, a, it was what I considered my biggest failure. For the next year, uh, I spent in a, in a staff position. I was headed down a road where I didn't know I was going to end up. But it turned out that became my biggest learning opportunity, my biggest source of insight. Because then I learned that what I really needed and what I needed to search for 
was an opportunity where I could explore my passion, where I could be an entrepreneur, where I could build and change. I needed the challenge. It turns out challenge is what fuels me. Challenge is what fuels me in my personal life. That's why I compete in Ironman. So I needed to look for the kind of job that allowed me to, to challenge myself. And that's what I did. Well, it turned out our company was going through a challenge of its own. It was transitioning from one contract to another for the first time in its 50 year history. And I knew that the company needed somebody who understood operations well, which I did, and somebody who had a good business education, which I did not. So I spent the next two years getting my MBA at Berkeley and Columbia went back to school. Uh, the company supported me. They invested in me. I invested in them. So I spent the same time working full-time helping the company make this transition. And it was a transformative experience for me, especially the education and the students that I worked with. Because they were all exploring creativity and entrepreneurship in their own ways, in many different ways. I, I was working with students that were in media, in food, in apparel. <coughs> entrepreneurship in Hollywood. What I learned was that all these different people were, had the same thing in common. They wanted to risk the status quo and create something better. It gave me a broader vision. I was no longer looking at how I could help the lab. I was looking at how I could help my company help the world. And it turned out the world was going through its own challenges at that time about the time that the country was trying to pull itself out of the recession and the federal government had just invested over $800 billion in the Recovery Act to help create jobs and improve the economy. And they were asking national labs to help by bringing technology to companies and helping them compete globally. The only problem was our lab was not asked to help. So I proposed to change that and our directors agreed. So that's how I found myself spending the next year and a half starting an office focused on bringing technology to the Recovery Act program out of our laboratory. In the process, it helped build our energy programs, which sustains to this day. Now I'm helping develop public-private private partnerships, <clears throat> like, like one with the uh, California Utilities. We're bringing high-performance computing that's used on many of our challenges at the lab to the electric grid, where there's a lot of data and a lot of technology that needs high-performance computing to analyze it. Also, I also put together and I formed a collaborative. I brought together people from the federal government, state government, industry, labs, universities, and we're focusing our efforts on improving California's manufacturing sector by bringing technology to small and medium-sized enterprises with new technology that <coughs> exists at universities and laboratories. And it's here I met some more creative people, like I did in my MBA program, exploring their creativity. Like Cameron Chen, who built a 3D printer, took a 3D printer, modified it in his kitchen, and built this piece of mathematically generated artwork. Now, that didn't take eight seconds. It took eight hours. That was a time-lapse video. <laughs> but there are commercial companies that are using the same technology in very creative ways. For instance, in the prosthetic limb market, uh, there's a company that is using scanners and 3D printing to create uh, replacement limbs for individuals that aren't the exact replica of their remaining limb, but something that embodies the creativity of the individual, customized for that individual. Or companies that are giving away designs of prosthetic hands on the internet to anybody in the world who has a 3D printer and wants to print it. And of course, technologies from the laboratory in the same additive manufacturing 3D printing space, they're creating Microarchitected materials that are lighter and stronger than any known man will end up in our cars and planes someday. So I'm grateful to the large company that I've worked for that's allowed me to explore my creativity and entrepreneurship within that company. It's taken me down a road that served me and my company well. It's like Richard Branson said, there's no greater thing you can do with your life or your work than pursue your passion for the good of the world and of yourself. What happens if we encourage the idea of serial entrepreneurship in a large company? Change the language so that it promotes this idea? I think the sky is the limit.
Because there are many of us. And we may not all look the same. We have the same thing in common. We like to build, create, and risk the status quo in order to make things better. Thank you.